<laughs> oh, nice. The natural hush coming over the room. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. San Francisco Dharma Collective. Wonderful to see many familiar uh, meditation friends here, Kalyana Mitra, as well as new faces. For those who haven't been here before, the San Francisco Dharma Collective is an entirely volunteer-run organization, which makes it pretty special. So it is a group of people who have decided that they want to create a space for community to exist with the Dharma. And then fortunate folks like myself, I'm Eve, we get to come here and teach and support this community. This uh, collective has a real primary intention of creating a space where it feels good to be in the Dharma together. And, and that's not actually always easy. And every time that we come together and constellate the space, we kind of have to refresh a commitment to that desire to find a place where it feels good to practice together. It's not a promise, right? We're all coming here with our own experiences and challenges and um, other qualities, and it might not always feel good, but the container that we hold is one that's really imbued with the qualities of the Dharma, which is non-harming, compassion, insight, clarity. And so before we begin, it's really so important for us to really think about like our intention for being here, both why we came and an intention for how we're gonna show up here. So the way to show up here is truly with absolutely the most kindness you could possibly imagine. And that doesn't mean just, you know, as folks are being kind and making space with chairs, but a kindness through not only our actions, but also a kindness through our mind, a kindness through our inner speech. So in the course of how we practice here together, there'll be a guided meditation, then there'll be some discussion and some teaching here. And throughout each part of this, so while we're practicing, while we're listening to others, while we're kind of reflecting on the teachings, how kind can you possibly be in your own mind towards yourself, one another? That's, that's really what's needed here. So that's my invitation. If that doesn't sound good to you, you can totally skip out after the practice. Um, as much as we'd love to, yeah, be able to kind of do a more thorough getting to know everybody every time, we kind of got to just rely on, yeah, this collective goodwill, like what brought us here, why we want to be here. And it's really important to us that this place can feel supportive for folks in their practice. It is an ongoing process to make it supportive here. And uh, one thing that we really love is feedback and it might not feel great to give it to me directly. You can give it to Mace or some of our many volunteers who are here, raise your hand volunteers in the mix. Hey, I like Cage is not raising her hand. She's like, okay. <laughs> super volunteer. Um, and yeah, so that can come in any form because truly this place is only living up to its mission if folks feel like they can come here and be at ease to practice and reflect together. Um, so tonight, I was saying earlier, I might be almost too excited about our new book, if that's possible. I'm so pumped. And it's so small. <laughs> For those of you who've been here, we just spent, I think, 13 months on a 600-page tome um, which is Old Path, White Clouds, the, the story of the life of the Buddha. And it was so beautiful and so wonderful. And this, even in its like slenderness, it's so rich. It's so rich. And the, you know, I think some of the benefits of this book, I, I think some folks, have some folks in this room read this book before? Yeah, Diane has. Yeah, Tom has. It's, it's really simple and clear. The author, Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, um, is originally from Tibet, though he grew up uh, in exile, as many Tibetans have since 1959. And he lives actually just in the East Bay. I am going to let him know we're doing this book, and we'll see. Maybe he'll join us one night. Um, that would be great. And he really, you know, I think you know, many, many skills that he is sharing with us because of his deep years of practice and retreat, and also his deep compassion and care for how to translate these teachings in a ways that really make sense in our modern context. 
And this is not a watering down and a secularization. I'm all for watering down and secularization in the right place, but it's not here. <laughs> I think here, like, let's go big into the sacred and into the mystery and into the beauty of what these practices offer to explore more than just well-being, but consciousness. Right? That's a lot that we can really um, understand and enrich our whole experience. So I really appreciate him making it simple, but not um, superficial. And in this practice or in this book, which is called The True Source of Healing, kind of a, yeah, it's a big claim. Um, true Source of Healing in under 200 pages. You got it. But uh, the main practice in this book, he calls it a soul retrieval. And that word and that term might mean a lot for a lot of different people. Um, soul retrieval is a term sometimes used in shamanic practices. And for those of you who might know, the practices of Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, or who don't know, he is a Tibetan Buddhist, but he's from the Ban tradition. So this is the indigenous tradition in Tibet that existed before the 7th century when Buddhism came from India. And so there's a lot of overlap and similarity with Tibetan Buddhism and Buddhism in general. And there's also such a different nuance, which is really a deep connection to the natural world. And, you know, again, in, in studying the life of the Buddha, as we all have been doing the last year or so in this class, Buddha not only woke up under a tree, like he continued to live under the trees. He walked everywhere barefoot. Like the natural world is so much part of the Buddhist practice, but not as explicitly as we see in this book and in this tradition. Um, and I really appreciate that. And so when he's talking about soul retrieval, he's actually talking about reconnecting to the natural essence of the world, which is already alive in us. We are the natural world. We're not separate from it. But how do we kind of reconnect to a sense of our soul and reconnect to a sense of what is it to feel a belonging with the world, the more than human world and other beings? So I, I just love this practice. I actually have found this book a true source of healing. So that's my N of one uh, claim. My me search, I have found it extremely helpful. And um, yeah, I think, you know, when, when, he describes, when he describes soul retrieval, you know, he just says it's... Uh, reconnecting deeply and completely with your soul, your genuine nature. And to do so, not only to have a, like an authentic and balanced life, but this is always, as in all Buddhist practices, the need to heal our own souls for the sake of all beings and for the earth itself. So just wanting to bring that in. And yeah, just really wanted to express such gratitude to Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche. This is such a beautiful book. These teachings are so clear. Uh, I'm so grateful. I think hopefully all of us a little bit fell in love or re-fell in love or more fell in love with Thich Nhat Hanh in our last book. And in reading these books, it really does create an opportunity for devotion for these teachers and these teachings. Ooh, that word. We're not going to get too far into it. Don't worry. Devotion. We did that maybe uh, just before Thanksgiving, talked about it. But think of it as just a real deep, deep gratitude, right? Such a deep gratitude. So I just feel and want to express such deep gratitude to Bongyal Rinpoche. And we kind of started a little early, a couple months back in one of the core pieces of his teachings, one of the ways we start establishing this inner refuge of healing. And that's in what he calls the three precious pills. And it's not coffee, coffee, and coffee, right? Um, <laughs> these three precious pills, yeah, they are actually stillness and the spaciousness, um, sense of warmth and the silence. And it really is so beautiful to practice these and give them each their own time. So we're going to do that again tonight. We'll probably do that again throughout this book to just really establish ourselves in these three precious pills. And I know some folks in the Sangha here in our community said that, you know, being with each of these really supported their practice overall and um, I love that Wang Gilram Pache, also very well versed in contemporary science and neuroscience. He's like, this is good for your nervous system. 
right? He wants us to know it's not just a, a mystical experience, but something at a physiological level um, that's so powerful. So we're going to um, do a practice. Welcome, welcome. Can anybody give up a chair for our dear friend here? In the back? Okay. Get it. Um, we're going to do a little bit of an unusual practice instead of, you know, instead of really going in and completely kind of diving into the practice for the entire arc of it, we're going to give ourselves time to really feel the preciousness of each of these practices. So we'll be starting with the stillness, and then I'll give us a moment to really reflect and notice what does this stillness practice feel like? And I'm actually going to invite us to then stand up, kind of move around, and then try the silence. After the silence, we won't stand up because it's really nice. There's a natural kind of blossoming from the stillness to the silence, and then this blossoming of spaciousness and warmth can happen. Um, so we'll take a little bit longer to practice. Um, again, for folks, if you're feeling sleepy and tired, mm -hmm. invitation is always to have your eyes open or feel free to stand up. All these practices can be done standing, no problem. And um, yeah, having a posture that really supports you doesn't have to be the posture you think is the ideal um, kind of sculptural approximation of the Buddha here. It doesn't have to be like this, but a practice that really gives you these qualities of uprightness and ease. So we can almost just try and explore that together. Like, what does it feel like to get a little more upright? So inhaling the shoulders up to the ears, feeling that lengthening, and then exhale, releasing that softness. And twice more, inhale, feel the lengthening, and exhale, softening. And one more time together. Mm. Mm. And then taking a moment and really kind of finding a sense of where the body feels balanced. This meditation posture is so instructive for the body and the heart and the mind. The posture should really inform a vividness and openness, but also a sense of real strength. and invite a softening and easing through the body. So we have the strength, the dignity, but also that ease, that softness. In this first of the three precious pills, the stillness. There's the simple level of stillness in that the body is no longer on its way anywhere. We're not moving, we're not going. So just feeling that sense of the body really fully being here, not on its way anywhere else. And even when there's feelings of agitation or discomfort, we can invite this quality of stillness. So this isn't to suppress or force ourselves from feeling. It's just reaching into something greater within the agitation around the discomfort. Can we still find and connect with stillness?
when Gyal Rinpoche says, as you become more familiar with stillness and its grounding qualities, you experience just being. Stillness becomes a doorway to the first inner refuge, the unbounded sacred space of being. So there's no rush here at all. Just continue showing up to this possibility of feeling stillness through the body. Of course, the mind will get caught up. Thoughts, memories, images. How kindly can we release whatever has captured our attention and return to this fullness of experiencing, you could even think of it as expressing stillness in the body. And this wonderful paradox that within more and more settling stillness, we start to feel the aliveness of the entire body. A couple more moments here. 
returning and refreshing this intention towards stillness, experiencing the just being, the doorway to the unbounded sacred space of being. And we don't want to disturb too much of the stillness, but there is an invitation to slowly move fingers and toes, and blink the eyes open, if it feels right, really keeping attention inward, but you could stretch upward. And just feeling the body maintaining that sense of being, so not kind of looking outward, but feeling the body. And see if you can notice any qualities of stillness in the body and the mind. What might that feel like? Being curious about the experience. And then we shift to this second precious pill, that of silence. And beginning by sensing the silence around us. Of course, there are sounds, but the relative silence, just as we aren't moving our body to go anywhere, Experiencing that stillness, the silence of not needing to say anything, to explain anything, really stilling this inner speech into silence, and feeling and connecting with the silence around us. And just as we experience stillness in the whole body, the invitation is to feel a sense of silence in the whole body as well.
Wangyal Rinpoche says, when your inner dialogue begins to release into silence, you become aware of the space of being. This awareness dawns like an inner light. So again, the silence shouldn't feel like we are shutting down, pushing away the thoughts, memories, and images. But we are finding spacious awareness in which all these thoughts and memories and images can arise and pass away. And then the natural shift or transition, we might find a glimpse of it as the body experiences a stillness. And some silence starts to allow us to settle more deeply. Just a sense of spaciousness can arise and emerge all on its own. And not just a blank spaciousness, but a warm spaciousness the warmth of our deeper nature, our deeper being shining through. And the spaciousness of awareness, that which exists around and behind and within all of our thoughts and memories and images. We might feel this like a leaning back in the mind. or as our sky-like nature of mind. Thoughts just like clouds. Not actually being a part of the mind, just something passing through. Wangyal Rinpoche says that at any given moment, when you're caught up in the stories and the drama of your moving mind, bring your attention to the open sky of your mind. It's always there. Connect with it. Feeling and connecting with this spaciousness brings genuine warmth.
these three pills can really interpenetrate one another. So the warmth. can help us feel guided towards the awareness of our silence. And may also really help us establish that sense of stillness, spaciousness in the body. And can we notice the distinction between these qualities so the body of stillness allowing a feeling of spaciousness, openness. And the quality of silence inviting something a bit brighter than spaciousness, awareness, knowing. And so we have spaciousness, we have awareness, warmth. And a sense of our genuine okayness. Not something created or fabricated. It's that beautiful intrinsic light. Don't worry how many times your mind slips away. Really feel that kindness and generosity with yourself coming back and refreshing, almost as though for the very first time. Each time there could be a new deep knowing, experiencing and feeling. The stillness and the silence, the warmth and openness. Taking a moment, really noticing if you feel a sense of being in the body. Sometimes our awareness and spaciousness can prevent us from fully inhabiting the body. When we go up and out, can you experience spaciousness and warmth and awareness within the body, but not limited to the body? awareness and spaciousness and warmth 
in front of us, above us, behind us, below us, on either side, and without boundary. And when the bell rings, see if you can sustain your awareness of your present state. Maybe even sustain some aspect of being still, silent, warm. Thank you for your practice. Before I hear from some folks about that practice, I just want to share this, this uh, description from Wangyal Rinpoche. He says, the three precious pills of stillness, silence, and spaciousness can help you connect with the true source of healing within. This connection may manifest just as a subtle sense of comfort with who you are. When this connection is lively enough, it can bring deep feelings of love and compassion. So it would be curious from folks, any reflections or questions on that practice? Um, and for folks who are here, please use the mic so our friends at home can hear. And for friends online, oh, Claudia, on it. Hi. 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 From Mexico right now. Mm. <laughs> it's 9.43 here. Anyway. Wow. Um, Thanks for joining. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, at first, when we were doing the stillness, I was feeling a little, my back was a little sore and I was having a hard time. But mm. then as I, as you kept on guiding us, I started feeling like it was a feeling of like relaxing and letting go, mm. like letting go, letting go. And then the, the silence and then the spaciousness, I didn't feel compassion. I felt joy. I mm. just felt great joy of being mm -hmm. in this space of well the sky you know nothingness <laughs> of, of I mean once in a while there will be yeah some thoughts but I was kind of it was pretty pretty good about you know those clouds going away and I just yeah. felt tremendous joy I just felt really happy mm. that's all thank you thank you for sharing <laughs> And you know, I know that's not always true, right? We don't always get that. And so to really be able to savor that in our practice when it comes. And you know, this is really, you know, these precious pills for him, 
this is, we're really just getting into the practice. Like this is not even the full practice, right? This is just, all right. You know, and, and in many forms um, of Buddhist practice and Tibetan Buddhist practice, you kind of start, okay, settle body, speech, and mind in their natural states. Then we're going to practice. We don't spend as much time really like getting into what does that mean to settle the body, the speech, the mind, and his kind of wording or languaging for it. This, um, I think is beautiful, but this idea that we actually have to make, um, Alan Wallace, one of my early teachers would say, you have to make the mind body serviceable before you meditate. So to just kind of make it serviceable, right? Cause we're not serviceable congested and fixated and um it can it can support that and it's concepts stillness i mean it's stillness at least is a thing right movement stillness okay i get it talking silence okay i get it spaciousness uh oh then we're starting to get very abstract and each of these you know has its parallels right like the stillness is creating a sense even within it of spaciousness and the silence creating awareness so it's really multifaceted and it can feel like too much thinking into doing which is why i'm really excited for us to keep practicing I, I would love to hear from folks. And again, there's truly no wrong answers, like always, but especially with this, like what's the difference between spaciousness and awareness? I know it's a hard question. Any thought? Jimmy's got like this, like, look. <laughs> Generally, awareness practice uh, my sense of awareness is usually of something. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm either aware of a feeling, an emotion, an object, or uh, an, an internal process, whether it's my breath or what the coming and going of thoughts, et cetera, images. That feels like awareness so there's there's this there's a there's awareness and an object of awareness spaciousness feels like awareness without necessarily an object mm. where it's it starts to really open up mm. the awareness is still there but it's it's really an awareness of of what isn't there, of spaciousness, hmm. of... I know, it's tricky. That was great. I appreciate it, truly. <laughs> I know, it gets really, yes, please. And especially if there's a first-person experience of it, like, what's it feel like? Yeah, I actually have, like, the opposite experience of Jimmy, which was why I was like excited that you shared that. Um, Cause for me, um, and this could also just be like the way that I'm practicing mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. When I conceptualize like doing a spaciousness awareness practice, spaciousness, spaciousness to me, there's still an object mm. that like feeling of space. Um, mm -hmm. When I'm focusing on spaciousness, I also really like to think about the space behind me, kind of like all around. Yeah. And that helps kind of like settle in. You were talking about that, like leaning back into it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think of awareness as like the plane where all of these things kind of like come up. Mm -hmm. um, so if awareness is like the tool that we use to like experience an object, um, spaciousness is still like some concept or object. Mm. and awareness is like the thing that knows yes. um yeah rather than the thing that it's knowing yeah if that makes sense yes and i'm curious what does spaciousness and this might be an impossible question but spaciousness as an object like feel like qualitatively as different than like knowing yeah um there still is like more of a physical physicality mm. to it mm -hmm. um like when i practice with spaciousness 
it's like feeling into the space around me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll start in the physical body, like mm -hmm. finding spaciousness in the body mm -hmm. and then noticing that like I'm feeling the air, I'm feeling and hearing these other kind of essences of space or ways of noticing space. Um, and yeah, I guess the distinction would be that it like it does seem more physical mm -hmm. than the awareness practice. And awareness practice for me also includes um, like more senses, mm. I would maybe say. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It is really hard to name. It is. Yeah. And it, and I don't want to be, thank you so much, AJ. That's really, yeah, very brave souls. Uh, and this isn't just to be, you know, extra sophisticated in our languaging. Like there is something so beautiful about being able to apply these different qualities in our practice. And as we move through the book, we'll see that we actually apply them for different reasons um, and they can have differential benefits. Now, I want to really hold in humility that this way of teaching and these words here are coming from one lineage. And there are different lineages within Buddhism and any other practices that will use these words different. So I'm sorry, because that's confusing. Um, definitely with Bongyal Rinpoche in this book, there is that sense awareness of kind of like knowing. And knowing is also a word. So I do experience it a bit like it's a light of knowing. Like as, as in when you turn on the lights, you see what's going on in the room that was dark. So awareness has this, like, you're not looking out into anything, but there is an, a, like a way of observing. And the spaciousness, indeed, a bit like what AJ was saying, is like this, something that is a little bit less of the knowing can feel corporeal, the spaciousness, but it's not just in the body. Like there is, and I don't know if anyone has experienced this, but a sense of the kind of periphery of the body dissolving a bit. Like the spaciousness doesn't have to just be in the body. And it's so weird, but it is really like truly nourishing to feel less like bounded in the body, bounded in the mind, right? It, it really helps. And I want to bring up, there's a, a term Ongyal Rinpoche uses a lot, especially in, in soul retrieval. And he's talking about what is it we are trying to kind of shake off with these practices. Um, and he describes that as um, our ability to kind of work with what he calls the pain body or the pain identity. So yeah, anyone who's listened to Wang Gil Rinpoche, he talks about this a lot. Um, and I think it's, it's quite helpful. The way that he describes the pain body or the pain identity is our fixation with kind of an idea of who we are and what we're supposed to be doing and what's happening. And that so much of our, our struggle and our suffering is caught up in this pain identity. So when we create spaciousness, it kind of like shakes loose some of that fixation, that kind of self-referential um, fixation, especially. Um, Eve? Yeah. Yes. Uh, oh, hi, a, Jason. A question. I don't mean to interrupt, but I wanted to say, since you're Please. looking at the book, what is the name of the, the title of the book? We have a question in the chat. The True Source of Healing. Okay. Great. And I wanted to um, put a, a, a word out about spaciousness just because my experience of spaciousness has been rooted lately in... Um, feeling like a sneeze, like a chew, and then letting this kind of like boundarylessness you just talked about actually occur. And it's very sensorial. It's like, um, I, I'm actually just using that as a way to kind of like the boundary disappears and my cells feel like they're opening. Yeah. And so it's a really great feeling. It's more of a, it's not a concept at all, but if it, it, it's like wow i can do this and it made me think a lot about like the um, the aesthetics who were able to float and like how did they do that how did, how would one become weightless it's like to be mm. fully spacious all of a sudden you don't have any mass you know so that's mm. one of one of the sort of things i've been 
separate from this comparison of awareness and stillness is just like that has a feeling beautiful yeah and i don't know if you know jason but there is um so there's a term kind of rigpa that's used in um, tibetan buddhism which is this kind of clear light awareness so it is both awareness and spaciousness together so when mm -hmm. they combine it's really this clear light and one of the ways you can kind of you know almost like back your way into rigpa is sneezing um ah. you get a very glimpse um also orgasm apparently uh, but there are these like shocks as you're saying to the like uh, I actually, I, I do think in, when you have been held down by a wave underwater and you first get that breath up, there's a bit of that feeling too, because there's not like, oh, it's Eve, I'm taking a breath of air. It's just like, right? Like unconfigured, unelaborated, like presence. And it's full. It's not dull. So I love that of trying to find find it in your life. Right, find the union of spaciousness and awareness. Find that sense of light, and um, yeah, I, I want to share his description of the pain body here. Um, he says, uh, as you seek a connection with spaciousness and liveliness and warmth of the universe, you may encounter discomfort or mental chatter that interferes with a full connection. So I, I like to unpack this a little. Um, so I like this idea that there's spaciousness, liveliness, and warmth in the universe, right? That all of those elements, and, and we'll go into, he, he really does hit on five elements and how we can retrieve from each of those elements, these qualities back into our life. And he says, discomfort and mental chatter that interfere. I think that's such a pithy way. Discomfort. Oh my God. So many kinds of discomfort. I'm hungry. I'm tired. Like, I don't like the way this smells, looks, listen, like there's so much, ugh, like agitation, right? So much discomfort. And he's really saying like, you know, this is an obstacle to us being in our true essential nature, those discomforts. It are not just like, oh, if I get rid of this discomfort, I'll be happy, right? No, like the discomforts are a distraction away. And then mental chatter, <laughs> such a good way of describing, again, like rumination, comparison, judgment, contempt, all of, it's not just this momentary like, oh, um, someone cut me off in traffic, that was annoying, but the like ongoing story of, I can't even live in the city anymore. And who are these people? And of course it's a Tesla driver, like whatever, like the, the whole thing, the mental chatter. And he says, um, I refer to this discomfort as the pain body or the pain identity, this ego identity related to our physical, emotional, and mental pain. The pain body obscures the openness that is the source of all positive qualities. But just that pain, like that kind of contraction. When your pain identity is active, the forest may be beautiful and the river may be inviting, but you are unable to receive their gifts. Um, yeah, so I just, I, I do. And he, he, you know, has so many talks on YouTube. Uh, he also has a cyber sangha. Um, so he gathers folks, um, I think it's once a month. Um, I, mm -hmm. This month he's going to have. Yeah, and he has them, and I was fortunate, I think, to be on once or twice, and he'll, like, gather guests to talk about a topic, and um, he talks about the pain identity a lot, and I think it's just, like, a pithy way, because when we say ego, it means so many things, it means, like, okay, like, yeah, I want to not be... I gotta, I gotta kill my ego or get rid of my ego, and I think that that is not only a confusing word, because it's been used in so many different ways, but this pain identity really relates. I, I think I shared last week or the week before, uh, when I came off my last retreat, I realized that last transition day, I truly felt it in my body, this transition between kind of getting to be no one, just practicing, to thinking about who I was gonna have to be again in the world. 
Like I could feel the contraction of identity and it sucked. <laughs> and I felt anxious and I didn't even realize I hadn't been anxious in seven days. I'd bought other things, but so that like contraction, like does that feel resonant? Like the pain identity? Yeah, I think it's a good word. Any questions on pain identity or ego? Like, what is that? I, I don't know. I think that word always gets a little confusing for people in the context of Buddhism. Um, hmm. Yeah. Would it be the same? as just through the way. Yeah. Like, yeah. The dissatisfaction. Yes. So you're saying would ego be dukkha or dissatisfaction? Or the pain body or pain identity. Yeah, it's interesting because I think dukkha or like, especially unsatisfactoriness, which is my favorite of those translations, it's pretty global, right? And and it is something we experience through all of our sense contacts with the world, uh, and including our mind. But I feel like the pain identity, it, it gets a little bit about, you know, this egoic sense of I need to be a projected version of myself. It's weird. You know, it's, it's, it's this construction of self too. So not only does our constructed self experience dissatisfaction and things not being good, there is that construction of the identity that it encompasses so much of our time and doesn't, yeah, really can be, can feel like such an obstacle. And yet, yes, we have two questions front and the back. Mace, you want to come? Okay. It just makes me think of the word should. Should. Okay. Right. Ego is like should. I should be this. And the pain body. And the pain body. Yeah. Should, 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 should. Mm -hmm. should. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is an idea of what we sh should. Yeah. Right? Yeah. As opposed to what we are actually experiencing um, and what's happening. And it's like, you know, these really elegant constructs like our ability to learn from what's happened in the past then kind of project what might happen in the future so useful and then such a trap yeah such a trap at the same time yes please it and actually oh uh, it was going to be basically in the same vein yeah thinking expectation expectation of like, i was thinking about that earlier when you were when we were talking about awareness and spaciousness and for me during the practice uh, spaciousness kind of happened to seem like a uh, kind of opening or removal of general expectation. Mm. Um, like it was uh, allowing more for not nothingness, um, but just allowing more for particularly externally things to be rather than, um, you know, should be or an expectation to be I yeah. think that feels similar to the identity right um, yeah that confinement that lack of spaciousness yeah. because uh there's these preconceived notions of expectations of what you want or who you want to be yeah thank you so much yeah and it, it is you know god so tough because we sit down to practice and we want like all right i don't need my identity definitely don't need my pain identity in this practice and then, whoop, <laughs> like, you know, it's like, what am I having for dinner? And what am I doing tomorrow? And like all these, you know, kind of tasks of our, um, our daily living and identity. It's so interesting that our thoughts are unbidden, right? That are like, we can think about stuff. That's helpful. We have a project or idea, but just their manifestation, their kind of proliferation, um, it feels so personal and that's why the spaciousness can be so helpful because it can, you know, if there's even that kind of like, all right, maybe I don't know this personally, but maybe I'm going to explore whether my thoughts are not that personal. That might give that just enough spaciousness to feel it. Any other reflections on the three precious pills? Yes. I find stillness. Most okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was saying that I find stillness the most confusing. Like s silence is that the other one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like spaciousness. That, uh, silence, actually, even in, even spaciousness, just based on my experiences meditating. Yeah. And what I've learned make more sense to me, but 
I'm relating it a little bit to something someone in the practice group, someone said earlier, mm -hmm. I don't remember how they said it, but the way I heard it was something about like when they were growing up that like you always had to be doing something. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if I have like a mental model really. I was thinking, I was actually mm -hmm. like imagining trees, for example, mm -hmm. and, or the feeling I have after waking up from a nap, I was like, is that it? Cause that's like when I feel the most calm. Yeah. Beautiful. But I don't know really. Yeah. And when you're sitting, is there a like, um, kind of monitoring of like, am I doing like, what is this? Am I doing it? Or like, how, how do you experience the not knowing? Um, uh, I, I, I guess the word would be disequilibrium. Mm. So it, would you say possibly discomfort? Yes. Or confusion. Is yeah. that, is that... yeah, that's great. Like, confusion is almost like a mental version of discomfort, right? The physical might be like, oh, like my body or, you know, I'm hot or I'm cold, or whatever it is. And then the, the confusion could be like a mental form of discomfort. Yeah. And I think that's, um, it's actually great noticing because there really is like the stillness is something that is intentionally to be brought to this, to the discomfort. And even though in this case, stillness is creating the confusion, right? But still we can work with and identify and bring towards like, what if, let's see, wait, how does he say it here? One moment. It's a very beautiful description. Um, so he says, this is again, very, very conceptual, but take time to feel the stillness as you rest in this awareness of the simple and direct experience of stillness, your mind becomes calmer, quieter, more settled and grounded. Feeling the stillness and connecting deeply with it allows you to be fully present in the moment even moments of restlessness. Your physical agitation can remind you to draw attention to stillness. Awareness of stillness can quiet your breathing, lower your heart rate. So I think there's, um, I like the tree image a lot. And, you know, I think it is, again, what do you start to notice in the body that might happen with the invitation to stillness? So for myself, right, like moving around, doing this, doing that, doing the other. And when I when I really invite stillness, it's almost like all of this energy that has been here starts to slowly feel like it's coming down. And there's like a still a, a sense of things stilling. But then, yeah, somewhat paradoxically, I feel like my uh, aliveness through the body. Does anybody else feel like, which is really interesting. So um, not saying to force you to feel aliveness, but just to know like that there's something around like, wow, I'm stilling this and then something else is manifest. And then again, the Tibetan Buddhist um, cosmology, you would call that the subtle body. So this idea that there is all within the body, there are all these channels of energy flowing and it doesn't have to be, you know, a so-called complementary and alternative approach, right? The subtle body, we know through our nervous system, there is a lot of different channels and energy flowing. And mostly we're so busy thinking about what we're doing. We don't feel that level of the body of just that natural flow. So strangely stillness actually kind of brings forth. It's like, almost could be effervescence or aliveness. But I like the tree because the tree, like the tree in its stillness is also like gently moving, you know, and it obviously has so much going on, like nutrients coming up and going down with energy going both ways. So I think the stillness when it feels inert might feel very strange, like still, like there's nothing still, like I'm uncomfortable or whatever, but like really... Yeah, I wish there was a better way of describing it. Anyone else willing to share about their stillness? Yes. Maybe Ulysses then Raph will go front to back. Um, so yeah, I had that that experience where I can be very still and then I realized I'm like 
Because, you know, once you're still, the, the, the mind becomes quiet. But then I notice my heart beating boom, boom. So <laughs> yeah. like, oh. And it was funny because I, I started thinking about that. You can't really be still. Um, then I was trying to quiet my breath and quiet my or lower my heart rate. Mm. And then I started thinking about my cells and I'm like, oh, they're, you know, they're vibrating all the time. Yeah. So it was really interesting. How you just mentioned that in your stillness, you feel more, more alive. Yes. Um, and then transitioning into silence and I let go of that. I, you know, I was able to quiet down a little bit. And, and what you were talking about earlier between awareness and spaciousness for me, awareness is that moment where I'm aware that I'm quiet, mm. I'm aware of my mind and I'm mm. not having thoughts. And very few times for me, spaciousness is that point where there's no boundaries. Oh, I can't tell the difference between where my feet begin, mm -hmm. where my feet end and the floor begins, mm -hmm. or my butt ends and the seat begins. It, it just becomes one. Mm -hmm. Few times do I have that, but that's for me like when I truly experience spaciousness where I yeah. just become one with the the environment. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm there. And I open my eyes and I ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Yeah. And I do think, you know, again, remembering and and maybe just noticing, it is cool. Like it's a it's cool and often these are pleasurable feelings, but they're deeply nourishing. You know, it's not just like, let me hyperventilate by, you know, going in and out of my breath for an hour and I feel totally trippy, right? It's like, it's deeply nourishing for us to be like present in our full body and to like invite these qualities inside. Even if we're like not there, like I can, I can imagine how many folks in the room are like, I don't know what y'all are talking about. Like the stillness, silence, spacious thing. Like I was just ruminating for, you know, 30 minutes also, you know, part of the practice. But when we do get those glimpses, truly, and check it out for yourself, just so it is the, you know, the true source of inner healing, you know, it really, because it's coming from within, it's like recalibrating our entire um, kind of like inner system. Whoa, I think I almost just answered a call. Sorry, guys, it was so weird. It'd be a really cool conversation to have. But um, you did my phone off, but I was experimenting with having it on earlier. And I, and I just think that really kind of being able to anchor like these experiences that are pleasant to like what we deeply need to heal. And, and healing, not just because like, oh, we're all broken, but like healing is like, that is what we are here to do. That's why, you know, in, in certain belief systems, like we incarnate into human bodies so that we can become more healed. Like we actually can't do that in, in these other realms. And whether or not you believe in, in that kind of cosmology, like this whole life thing is like a healing journey, right? <laughs> I mean, I know it's like a little bit of a bias sample because people come to meditation when shit's hard, right? <laughs> so there's a lot of people who know the need for healing here, but like everyone, even with the so-called like good life, like we all need to heal, right? So thank you. Yeah. I was smiling so hard because I was just exactly the same wavelength. <laughs> and um, to build on that, one of the things, for me, the experience of stillness, one of the things that I love the three pills. They've been so helpful. And a thought I keep having, which sometimes turns into a feeling, sometimes stays intellectual, is the stillness. Um, I think about how stillness is not staleness. It's mm. nothing. The stillest that I feel is when there's a little breeze but mm -hmm. it's moving so smoothly mm -hmm. that I feel it almost at the same level as a warm bath that is exactly the same temperature as my body. Mm -hmm. It's not nothingness, it's somethingness. And the difference with awareness is almost like awareness is me intellectualizing that and thinking about it, whereas the spaciousness is when it's just mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. when the isness kind of expands. Mm -hmm. And so with the heart, I had many years ago, I got a chance to go into one of those chambers that they use to test audio equipment that's unbelievably quiet. The yeah. ones where you can't hear anything from the outside. 
and you stand inside of it. And after a second, I just remember feeling like I was a, like at a drum and bass rave, but it was just my heart beating, but because there were no other sounds, yeah. it's overwhelmingly loud. Beautiful. And, uh, and so something that I often come back to when I'm thinking about the three pills going through the exercises, um, thinking about as deeply as possible like what is going on inside of those cells and of how every part of the body is so infinitely fractal and complex and like the surface area of your gut is like a football field like all of those kinds of things and it feels a little bit the felt experience the importance of it for me is that if my awareness is like i'm on a little boat in a small pond and it feels really big mm -hmm. After doing that, it feels like within me, there's the pond is actually like seven miles deep, mm -hmm. like, you know, like Beautiful. James Cameron's at the bottom, you know, in a submarine. And in comparison, my thought, the little boat is like tiny. Yeah. And so it gives me more space. space yeah. And, um, and then, yeah. And then, and then at some point you're like, oh my God, it's, everything else is also part of it. And then the quantum that's, level that's how deep you want to go yeah right. beautiful yeah and i think i will say though awareness shouldn't intellectualize and it, i think it's so hard for um, a lot of folks who are raised in our, our contemporary modern culture where we think about everything yeah and we that's awareness is thinking but there is a different level of awareness that isn't thinking and I, again, I'm like the like the only thing I can really think of to describe it is light, um, spaciousness, spacious. <laughs> so, but the, but the intellectualizing can happen, but then we're intellectualizing. We're no longer like in awareness. And then, as Jimmy was saying, I meant to follow up on Jimmy's comment. We can then direct our awareness and apply it to our breath, to our body, right? And and then there's like this readiness of our awareness and it is always already there, always already there. And that's the part that's, uh, yeah, it's really cool to start having some confidence in that. And I think, did you say confidence? And I think spiritual confidence is like, it's such a beautiful place where you start to feel like those qualities are actually alive. It's not something you're like working toward. They're like here and they start to emit more fully. There's such a fluctuation between the, the, the feeling of these things and the feel, the experience of the, these kinds of things that I was describing and then chasing their, the tail and then yeah. you're feeling it and then you're describing it yeah. and you're like thinking about it. Yep, grafting. Yeah, it's a strong always. Thing. Thank you so much. I think we have one hand online. Hi. Haven't yet seen you in the center, but I know you're coming one of these days. Someday I'll come. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I really want to. I want to come down there um, for a number of reasons, but um, I'll get there. Uh, okay. I, um, ha I, I thought it was really cool, um, too. I had the same experience twice now i was looking at his other books so awakening the sacred body and i listened to that one and now i'm in the middle of um the luminous mind awakening the luminous yeah. mind and um at some point i don't know i was just sort of casually doing the practices and listening and thinking about all this and i had something at one point in one of the books he talks about um this like um um not big event um not special event um it's like oh famous person or a famous um something that you're ruminating about basically and I have two of those things and at some point earlier today it was like and this happened in the sit too as we moved toward spaciousness, and it was spontaneous when it was earlier today, I was just doing my thing, I'd start to feel bigger, like I feel bigger. And yeah. like the, 
as I move more toward the spaciousness and the spaciousness and the awareness become more unified. And I kind of look at those things for what they are, um, they get smaller. They seem mm. to get smaller and have less of an um, ability to get me or for me to get caught in them. And it becomes mm. more, if I had to describe it as an image, less like a tree. And I know I'm a tree lady. It should be a tree for me, but it's a mountain. <laughs> it's be more like a mountain. And I get more grounded and I feel more solid. And it's more like, um, you know, like, Gulliver and the Lilliputians, like a bunch of Lilliputians named Mara that are just kind of doing their thing, but they don't really have the ability to yeah, affect me the way that they have before. And now this is the super cool thing. I have that as a resource. I went back to the ruminating at one point and then I was like, oh, no, no, I'm the you know, 40 foot tall Buddha or whatever, you know, I'm, I don't have to worry mm. about that. And it was yeah. instantaneous. I was like, oh, it just yes. was so cool. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. And again, I love how it can be applied. And I do think it's interesting. It's so, it's so interesting. We have the tree and the mountain and we haven't even gotten into the elements explicitly, right. Uh, that are here and, and woven throughout the book, but we can find these qualities in the natural world. And I know I've mentioned here a number of times, sky gazing practice, which is a pretty common practice in Tibetan Buddhism. And you really, you know, you see that spaciousness of the sky and we live in the best place in the world for sky gazing. There's so many hills, you get high, you see a lot of sky, right? You're like downtown Manhattan. It's like, it's like that much sky, right? We have a lot of sky opportunity and the mind, it really like, it really responds to that spaciousness. And we get like an instruction, like from the mountain or from the tree, we get an instruction of, oh, spaciousness of mind. So it is it is really lovely to draw from the natural world. And, you know, just that description of feeling bigger than these thoughts, or, you know, you were saying Mara, these kind of difficult, demonic, uh, ruminative thoughts and feelings that really can overtake. And that's why we need the soul retrieval. He says that uh, soul retrieval, we have to find our natural spontaneity, creativity, ease, and playfulness. And I, and I, like, I love that as like, oh, that's my birthright. Those are my qualities. And I lose them, but I like finding your way back. And, you know, yeah, it's interesting. Spontaneity, creativity, ease, and playfulness. Um, and, you know, we will be in the weeks to come, like cultivating earth, water, air, and space. And from each of those, like we are kind of brought, bringing these qualities back. Very beautiful. Thanks, everyone, for sharing and those even who didn't share. Yeah, Diane. I have a question. What chapter are we, are we on to next week? Very good. We are. We haven't even made it through the preface. Okay. <laughs> I'm like skipping around a little, but I really want to take it slow because a lot. I mean, a lot of these words they they say so much. You know, they're really in there, um, and it's interesting because like one part of this, like soul retrieval. Um, whatever is the word he's translating from Tibetan, uh, he doesn't say it here. Uh, I could ask Chandra. Um, soul retrieval was also a practice that was used when um, there was uh, kind of illnesses in ancient Tibet, when they are not even ancient Tibet, but in, in, in Tibet kind of more... Um, before, I guess, the invasion, when it was in the more rural areas, there was a sense that kind of spirits were being um, uh, made angry in some way or another, and that they were recommended for patients who were also just energetically drained, 
but then have any clear diagnosis. Who fits that description, right? Like energetically drained, no diagnosis. Or like, that's, yeah. And so I was like, wow, yeah, okay. Um, and that these soul retrieving rituals, right? Like what we're going to be working on here with the precious pills and then, you know, just to not make it feel like uh, too much anticipation or a cliffhanger, we're going to be just imagining the qualities of nature, inviting them in, right? And a lot of the invitations are to go and then find these qualities in the natural world. And I know a lot of people here, I'm sure, already have a relationship with the natural world. And we might not intentionally or explicitly be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to water because I need fluidity. I'm going to earth. I, I need that stability. But how do we create the intentionality of retrieving what is from the natural world to then like be our inner essence, right? Um, which is beautiful. And it is kind of like, like we're having to have it mirrored for us so that we can really kind of feel it and experience it in ourself. Or if you're like a video game person, you're like going out and get stuff, <laughs> taking it in like little Mario, you know, getting your things from the world. And so just as a, a basic overview, we're going to come back many times, but earth, and again, it's just, it's interesting to feel and notice if there's resonance with these descriptions from earth, we get the quality of groundedness and connectedness from water, comfort and fluidity from air, flexibility and movement from fire, joy and inspiration and from space, openness and accommodation. And so there's, you know, he has, we're probably gonna have to use one of the, the chart thingies because such elaborate tables that he uses to identify what are you missing and what are you needing? And I just think starting to develop a relationship with being able to, not in a pathological way, but self-diagnose, like, am I missing groundedness? Am I missing joy? Am I missing a sense of fluidity with what's happening? It's so powerful to have that. Um, and I do like that it's not, again, in this kind of pathological approach of what's wrong with us. Though, of course, there's so many great things about modern medicine. I do think it's really nice to feel that we can be, you know, part of our healing journey, right? Not just relying on the outward. Um, mm -hmm -hmm. Yeah, and he also says that soul retrieval, it's done through these practices, but it can also be done like just in nature. Like people experience soul retrieval in nature. Like there's a natural way they can have that. And also we can have soul retrieval if we start dealing with our difficult emotions and start actually cultivating, you know, more wholesome states like our four measurable practices like that is a way to promote soul retrieval um yeah and you know it's interesting he he talks about kind of how like how do we lose our soul like how does that happen he has a couple a couple reasons he said it could happen he says it can happen through trauma like early in our life uh, through uh, some kind of energy injury and accumulated stress. Oh, well, like, oh, okay. Yeah. So like everybody, <laughs> but that also an entire um, country, a culture, an ethnic group, a religious group can also experience soul loss through degradation and bias, right? So soul retrieval is something that's needed and might be needed on various levels of who we are and what we've experienced in this life. So... Yeah, I hope I had held enough of my enthusiasm in since we're on page three of the preface. <laughs> but this book is so good. Um, yeah, so it's just, I'll just share this one uh, last line from him. He says, whether soul retrieval is done through communing with elements of nature, clearing out difficult emotions and cultivating beneficial qualities through connecting with uh, subtle wisdom states in Dzogchen practice, it points us towards the same experience, a deeper connection with the spacious awareness that is our authentic self, the source of all positive qualities in a human being and uh, 
a positive quality human being needs to be joyful and fulfilled and lead a life that benefits others. So he says, it points us towards a deeper connection with spacious awareness that is our authentic self. The source of all positive qualities a human being needs to be joyful and fulfilled and lead a life that benefits others. That is a great aspiration. Let's set our uh, mind towards that ability to dedicate it to all beings. So coming back to the body and softening in the face and the chest and the belly. Just for a moment, allowing the mind to alight upon this possibility of stillness, silence, warmth, and openness. And if it feels comfortable placing hands in front of the heart in a gesture of offering, then dedicating this practice to all the many beings in our world, the many beings who are acutely suffering, the many beings who are chronically suffering, even the beings who don't know they are suffering. May we dedicate any benefit of our time together that all beings would feel safe, all beings could know belonging, that all beings could be truly and fully free. Thank you, everyone.